All right, so we're going to kick things off so I can maximize the amount of time that Jeff has for his presentation. So thanks so much, guys, for joining. This is an AMA with the Jeff Blankenberg. Some of you guys were on his Twitch stream earlier today, so you get a double view of Jeff today. So thanks for everyone joining. Uh, welcome for anyone who hasn't been part of one of our AMAs before. Uh, these are, is, this is a webinar series hosted by Voiceflow. Uh, we make it easy for people to design, prototype, and build voice apps with little to no code. Making it easy for anybody to be able to take anything from prototype to build, and obviously Alexa is one of the core places that we push people to publish. Um, and ideally we want to democratize conversation design and development for everyone. So if you guys have any questions about that afterwards, definitely shoot us a message. In this series, we're going through a bunch of interviews with thought leaders, with creators and their stories, and connecting businesses with futurists. And ideally, we want to do so by growing this community of amazing voice developers and designers. So with that being said, let's get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar, hi, I'm Emily. I'm the head of growth at VoiceFlow. Uh, and I am super excited today to sit down and talk with our featured guest, Jeff. Can you give us a little intro? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Blankenberg. And uh, I, like the slide says, I'm an Alexa evangelist at Amazon. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into this a little bit more, but basically my job is to kind of be uh, like developer zero for Alexa skills. And so I spend a lot of my time building voice experiences and, and writing a lot of code, either on Twitch or on a number of other places. And then I spend a, a good portion of my time going back to the product teams at Amazon and saying, well, this needs to be better. We need to tweak this. We need to fix this. This would be, this would make things easier. And so that's, uh, that's kind of a, the core to my job, I guess. Awesome. So today, Jeff has uh, prepared a little bit of a lightning talk to go through some tips and tricks that you should know about designing and developing for voice. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jeff to get started. Awesome. Thank you. And so I'm going to flip over to this. Uh, and this is a talk that I've, I wrote and I gave, uh, I've given a couple times. Uh, and it's normally an hour. And I've trimmed a bunch of stuff out. And we're going to try and do it in 15 minutes. So if nothing else, you should be impressed that I'm able to get through all this in 15 minutes, hopefully. Um, so thank you guys all again. Uh, this is 10 apps, 10 things every voice app should do. And this is universal. It doesn't apply to just Alexa or just uh, any of the other voice assistants out there. This is things that you should be thinking about anytime you build a voice experience. So number one, um, you should really focus on doing one thing really well. An example of that that I like to use is a skill I built called Games Back. Now, obviously, we don't have a lot of sports right now. But uh, with baseball, one of the things that I always care about every morning is I go to the webpage and I look up the standings and I say, how is my team doing? My team happens to be the Cleveland Indians. And so I jump in and I wanna see how many games back there. That's the column that I really care about more than anything else. If they won or they lost last night, that's great. But what matters is how many games back from first are they? And if they're not in first um, or, if, or otherwise, are they in first? That's kind of the thing that I'm looking for. Um, so what I did is I built a skill that specifically just gives me that one piece of information. So if you have an Alexa device at home, you can say, uh, you know, I'll say, I won't say her name a lot, but uh, ask games back about the Cleveland Indians. And she'll tell you basically what the standings at the end of last season were because the data hasn't reset yet because we don't have a season this year. Um, but the idea is that I'm just doing that one thing. I'm not telling you about wins and losses or when their next game is or how they did yesterday. It's just focused in on that one simple task. And you could continue to add things to it, but this is kind of the core idea. So we really want to just do one thing really, really well. Okay, number two, um, make your name memorable. This is kind of a fun story to tell. There's a great skill in the Alexa Skills Store called the Magic Door. Uh, and all, the way that they advertise their skill, obviously there's a door there on their icon, but they tell people to say like, open the magic door and it will start the skill. And you hear this creaky old door open and then you enter into their adventure. So that's kind of the idea behind uh, what I want you to think about here. But there's lots and lots of ways to do this. The key to this is that if you think about any app you have on your phone, right, there's an icon and there's a name. And as I'm flipping through my phone, I can easily find um, the thing that I'm looking for because I, I have it in a list. And I might, as I scroll past the page, remember that like, oh, yeah, I forgot I installed that thing. With voice, we don't have that luxury. So we really need to be specific and focused in on how do what people remember how to use our stuff. These are some example names. I just made these up, uh, but you can see there's lots of different ways to refer to a skill, right? So I might say run or resume or load or launch. All of these words really mean the same thing. Um, it's just a matter of how you 
tie them together with whatever your name is going to be to allow the, the user to find your skill easily. So um, launch rocket ship stories might make a whole lot of sense or open box maker if that's the name of your skill. Um, in each of these cases, though, you can kind of play with this a little bit to find the launch word that matches up with what you're trying to accomplish. I have a skill <clears throat> and it gives you three clues. I'll let you guys think about this, but I'm not going to wait for an answer. Um, I'm going to give you three clues. They all have something in common. And the three clues are ears, socks, fruit. They all have something in common. Maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe you won't. You can drop it in the chat if you'd like. Um, but the, that's the idea of the game is I give you three clues and then you have to figure out what those things are. And so I, it's a trivia game, right? It's, it's challenging your mind a little bit. And I thought, well, the word trivia has the word, the letters T-R-I in the front. Maybe I should use that, right? So I thought about like via try, right? I flipped the words and became this cool thing. And it means like by way of three, which I thought was like a really clever name for it. Um, and there, I realized very quickly that no one's going to remember this name. That's not memorable. It's not useful. It's not something that's going to stick with them. Um, and I need them to be able to remember how to play my game or they're not going to. And so ultimately I came up with the idea to call it three clues, which makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, it makes it very, very easy for people to remember what the thing is. It's the game that gives you the three clues, right? It's, it's really, really simple. So think carefully about your name. It's, it's very tempting, especially when you like have a startup or a small business to have some crazy name. Like I remember when Verizon first came out, I thought that was such a weird name. Uh, obviously they've built some memorability into that name, but most of the time starting from scratch, having a memorable name can be hard. And so you really want to think deeply about that. Okay. Number three, focus on intents, not commands. Let me tell you what I mean. I'm working on a skill right now called dev tips and it's meant for Alexa developers to be able to come in and get answers to all their questions about Alexa build skill building, but also like kind of in a meta way, like hear the sound effects that are available in the library and hear all the speech cons that you can use and whatever, all the different kind of like sound effects and audible things you can do inside an Alexa skill. I want you to be able to experience those without having to go build something to try it. And so I started out with commands like this, right? Ask dev tips about monetization or tell me about persistence. And what I realized really quickly is that I have a database of all of these terms, but the users don't. They don't know that monetization is a thing they can ask about. They don't know that persistence is in the list. And so while these things do work, I also had to enable things like this. Teach me something new, play a speech con for me. What should I learn next, right? And by giving those kinds of things, um, capabilities inside my skill as well. It makes it really easy for somebody to explore. You can't assume that they know what to say or that they know what your content is. It's much easier to give commands like this from a user um, so that they can con continue to, to move and grow inside your skill. Another one, number four, is simplify choices. This is my favorite one out of the 10. Um, and the reason for that is because we don't often think about a conversation uh, in a deep, meaningful way. I mean, maybe the folks that are here right now do, but in general, we don't tend to think deeply. And if you think about it, most conversations are a back and forth, bouncing between each other, maybe interrupting. Sometimes there's questions, but when you ask that question, there's a, there's a variety of answers you could give, right? So what, what are all the questions we can ask and how should we think about asking those questions? The big one for me is we often tend to lead with open-ended questions. These are not those. Look at these questions. Is there something else I can help you with? Do you have another question? Would you like to know something else? The answers to all of those questions are yes or no, right? Those are the two cases. If they say yes, what are you going to say? You're going to say one of these. Okay, what do you want to know? Or what can I help you with? Or what topic can I assist with? So skip that process entirely. Don't ask yes, no questions unless it absolutely makes sense. Instead, ask questions like this that get, get them to the point and let them know exactly, let you know exactly what they want to do. So I have a quick question. Um, I, normally I would have people raise their hand when they know the answer, but I'm trying to move fast. So we're going to, I just want you to, when you know your answer, I just want you to lock it into your head uh, as we go through this. So I'm going to present you with a choice and you have to choose one of these options forever. Okay, here we go. So as soon as you know, just lock it into your head, commit to your choice. Boom. Everybody has either picked vanilla or chocolate at this point. It's not a hard choice. Everybody is pre-programmed for this. And if you chose chocolate, you're wrong. Okay, so in the next choice, I'm going to do the same thing again. Whoop. I'm going to do the same thing again, but I want you to do the same thing and see how long it takes you to make your choice. And I gave it away already, but here we go. Looks like this. Now, you're still only allowed to pick one choice. And in that case, it takes you much, much longer to dig in and say, which one is it? Which one do I want? Did anybody pick Swamp? Did anybody choose Swamp off the board? I'm guessing you probably didn't. Uh, it looks like this. It actually sounds fantastic, but you should never call an ice cream flavor swamp. Okay, 
So let's get back to thinking about limiting choices and thinking about how this stuff works uh, with your users. Imagine I have a fruit stand and I build a skill for it and I say things like this where we have apples, bananas, oranges, lemons, grapes, kiwis, blackberries, strawberries, and mangoes. And then I say, what fruit did you want? The challenge with this, the challenge with uh, asking a question this way is that one, we've given them a very long list and it's very, very hard to figure out exactly what one I might want. By the time you say mangoes, I've already forgotten that bananas might, might have been in the list. In addition to that, I asked the question afterward. And because I have to ask it afterward, um, I didn't know that you were asking me to pick one. You were just telling me stuff and I wasn't paying as much attention as I probably should have. So we can flip this around a little bit. Let's limit our choices and ask the question first. So I say, what fruit do you want? Apples, bananas, or oranges? You could probably also tweak this to say apples, bananas, oranges, or something else. And if they say something else, or if they just say grapes, great, then grab the grapes and go do the thing that they wanna do with the grapes. Uh, number five, use the one breath test. Um, here's a really good example of that. I built a Star Wars skill that has lots and lots of content about everything you could imagine in the Star Wars universe. Everybody knows who this guy is. And in adding him to my content, I found a really good description of Luke Skywalker. And it was this, right? It's really, really long. Luke Skywalker was a tattooing farm boy who rose from humble beginnings. It's so long. The good rule of thumb is if you can't say it in one breath, it's too long. And so this is probably two or three breaths. What I did instead is, is as an example, is that I used for the Darth Vader example, um, if, you say, if you ask the skill about Darth Vader, she just says, Darth Vader is a bad, bad, bad man, right? Very simple, very to the point, a little bit of humor in there, um, but it still gets to the point. And so that's the thing that we're really trying to accomplish. I could really narrow down my description of Darth Vader to one breath. Uh, and if people want more, you could offer that, but I wouldn't just lead with tons and tons and tons of content. Uh, you, you often lose people's attention. Okay, number six, uh, I hope we're doing good on time. Include a variety of responses. Uh, this is something that's really, really important to me. I do this all over the place and the folks that uh, watch me on Twitch um, certainly have seen plenty of this. But when we build applications for mobile or for web, um, you often find that there are specific rules that they want you to follow, right? This is the iOS style guide. This is the, the Android style guide. They have, they have words like predictable and consistent. And those things are absolutely 100% the opposite of what we want voice to be. With voice, it needs to be unpredictable. It needs to be something that you are engaged with and that you're actually listening to and choosing to play along with. And so what I like to do is to keep everything fresh and random. Uh, for every single thing that my skill, my skill can say, I like to have five to seven versions of that thing. Hey, here's an example. I have, this is a service called Airtable and I have a table called goodbye. And in this table, I have about a hundred different ways to say goodbye to my user. It's not a big deal. Goodbye shouldn't even be a meaningful thing, but I have all of these crazy ways to say goodbye, like live long and prosper or Got to get going, I get it. Or out the door dinosaur, right? There's a whole bunch, I don't know if you guys know, but like after a while crocodile, um, those kinds of things. There's like two dozen of those with animals. Got to go buffalo. I had no idea. I thought it was just limited to um, amphibious style animals with teeth, but I, I'm wrong. Okay, so you can see I have lots and lots of answers here. And what I do every time that I, someone tries to exit my skill, I just grab one of these uh, randomly and give it to the user. So every time they leave my skill, it's kind of this adventure. They don't know what they're gonna get. You can do this with everything. Vary the order, vary the, the content that you're using, but by keeping people on their toes and not letting it be predictable, uh, very, very quickly, you'll find that they stay more engaged and they're participating more in the, the conversation with, the, with their voice assistant. The other thing that I really like to do is to randomize the order that you present things to users. So here's a good example. You're building something for a travel agency um, and you know that these are the five things that you need in order to allow the user to make a, a flight search, right? They wanna look for flights or look for a destination. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I might always do it this way, right? Where are you flying from? Where are you flying to? Uh, what airline do you wanna use? When are you flying and when do you wanna return, right? We could do it that way. But what's to say the second time that they come back to do this, we don't completely throw the order out, right? When do you, when do you wanna leave? It doesn't matter what the order of these things is. We just know that we want all five of those values. And so by mixing it up, it doesn't feel automated. It doesn't feel like I'm filling out a form with my voice. It feels like I'm having a conversation with someone and I'm just answering their questions. So this is another really, really good example of how we wanna think about randomizing the order that we do things, not only the way that we say things. Okay, number seven, we're cruising. Handle the unexpected gracefully. Uh, one of these examples is 
um, errors. Errors are going to happen from time to time. Maybe an API is down, maybe you, you built something and it didn't work properly, um, but errors can happen. This is the kind of response that Alexa will do uh, for you by default. There's always default error messages, but you should control and manage these to make it seem like something accidentally happened, but you've handled it and let's keep going. Here's a good example of that. Uh, it seems our trivia questions are better than our software developers. Something's broken, but we've alerted our team to the problem. Can I offer you a random trivia question instead, right? The trivia question stuff is working, but whatever they were trying to do is broken. So let's instead think about how do we redirect them? Maybe add a little humor to it, make fun of yourself like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we screwed up. And then just carry it back to where they were going. Um, something really important to think about, but not something that people pay a lot of attention to. There's always opportunities for things to go wrong um, and having some fun with it makes a big difference. A good example of this is my baseball skill. Uh, if I came in and I asked about the Cleveland Indians or the New York Yankees or the San Francisco Giants or whatever, uh, my skill's ready for all of that stuff. But what if they say the New York Jets? What do I do then? I don't have the New York Jets in my database. Um, I don't wanna just throw an error. I need to do something with this information. So what I do in my case is I say, I'm sorry, the New York Jets aren't a baseball team. Is there a different team I can tell you about? And I'm redirecting them rather than just saying, uh oh, I don't know what to do. You say, oh, here's the thing you said to me. That's not a baseball team. Why don't you say the name of a baseball team and then we can do the thing that you were trying to accomplish. So this is a really good example of how you can kind of redirect people to the thing that they should be doing instead of whatever they tried to say. Number eight, make enhancements based on data. Um, publishing a skill is not the end, it's more or less the beginning. Um, and as you're building things, you'll see that you can collect a whole bunch of data about what's going inside, on inside your skill. What are people saying? What are people asking for? Uh, anytime that I'm collecting data from a user, I always persist that to a database so that I can compare later and look and say, um, what are things that people are asking my skill for that I'm not accommodating, right? By parsing through that data and looking at it in a deep way, we can say, oh, we should be fixing this. Another good example is intents, right? If we think about something like my dev tip skill, we have a get news intent, we have an answer intent, we have a launch request, that's where they start. Uh, and you can see that get news seems to be the most popular intent where things like display template intent are very, very infrequently used. So when I ask myself, what am I gonna build next? It should be focused on what are the people using the most and how can I continue to provide value to my users? Okay, number nine is provide contextual help. This is something that we all skip over, but it's always required, right? We have to provide help inside of our skill and we often do things like this. This skill lets you order from our big menu of pizza, breadsticks, pasta, sandwiches, wings, and desserts. What would you like to do? And all I've done is give them another opportunity to ask for something, but I haven't actually helped them. They were in the middle of ordering a pizza and they weren't sure um, how to get double sauce. So they said help. Um, and we didn't give them any of that assistance. So what help should look like instead is more like this. Oh, it looks like you're trying to order a pizza. You can add or remove toppings by saying things like add pepperoni or remove anchovies. You can also add extras, cheese, whatever. Um, do you want to get back to your pizza or did you need help with something else? because it's possible that they didn't need help with the thing they were doing right now. And in that case, you could try to redirect them to the appropriate kind of help that they're looking for. Um, but help is super important because people can get lost. There's no UI, there's no, um, there's no visual clues to let them know like, oh, you're supposed to click this button or you're supposed to go over here. They're only using their voices and sometimes they just can't figure out exactly what that thing should be. Okay, last one, beta test with real users. I can't emphasize this enough, but if you're not getting your skill out in front of real people, um, then you're never ever going to feel like it's um, as successful as it could have been. Because we have, each of us has in our minds about how people speak and we're at best 15 or 20% of the real world. So we need to get other people in front of us. We need them to talk to our skill. We need to help them, have them under, help us understand what's going on. So the way I like to do this, this is a beta test in Alexa, but you can set up an official beta test but what you really want to do is get people you know to use this stuff. Um, this stock image family is a fantastic example of that. But what you really want to do is invite your friends and your family, people that will give you open, honest feedback. A lot of times if you just open it up to people you've met online or a large mailing list or something like that, very, very few people are going to tell you anything. Uh, they may use your skill a couple of times, but they're probably not going to give you the kind of meaningful feedback you're looking for. So one thing I like to do is to bring my team together. This is a bunch of the folks uh, from the Alexa team a couple of years ago. And we were sitting just playing with each other's skills and trying stuff out and saying, oh, why didn't that work? Or why, you know, I just said this thing, what happened? Uh, it was a really fun way to kind of share the things that we had built and try stuff out. But the thing for all of you, if you're working in your offices or whatever on voice stuff, the thing I recommend is taking the Wizard of Oz approach. And there's two lessons to be learned here. The first is, um, 
if you're trying to build something that replicates maybe a mobile app or a website that you have, um, a good rule of thumb, Wizard of Oz style, is that anything that inside your app or your website that takes more than three clicks to get to, that a user wants to go to regularly, are the things that you should be building for voice. So I always think about that three clicks of the Ruby slippers as a way to remember like, oh, those are the things that we should really be focusing on. If they can get it by opening your app, that's probably always gonna be faster. So it's something to keep in mind. But as far as testing goes, um, you should have somebody behind the curtain, like the wizard. Sorry if that's a spoiler for anyone, the movie's been out 85 years or something. But um, you should have someone standing behind a curtain and they know what the skill should be able to do. And then you have people come up and talk to the curtain. So they can't see facial expressions um, and they can just ask the skill to do things. And the skill has to respond in the way that it's programmed to do. Of course, it's just a human, but you'll learn very quickly how people want to interact with this content and how they want to interact with this skill just by letting them come and talk. And that curtain makes a big difference because when you have faces, you laugh, you, you learn a lot of body language that you wouldn't have gotten if you were just a device. So really, really useful stuff to think about for your beta testing. Okay. So that was a lot. That was a whole bunch of numbers and things in like 18 minutes. Uh, so this might be something to take a screen grab of if you want, but this is the 10 things that I just covered. Uh, so I'll give you five, four, three, two, one, and then I will say thank you very much. Uh, that was the end of my presentation and we'll get back to Emily. Awesome, thank you so much, Jeff, that was great. Um, and don't worry guys, uh, we will be sending out a recording of this and we will make all of these available uh, on demand on our events page. Uh, I'm sure myself included, we'll definitely be going back. So thank you, Jeff, for speeding sure. through that. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to go back and share my screen, uh, and we're gonna get into the questions. I see that some of you guys already started to, um, I see that some of you guys already started to add into our Q&A, so feel free to continue to do that as we hum along. Uh, we're gonna be getting to those shortly. All right, so to kick things off, Jeff, you have a really interesting background going from an e-commerce developer at Abercrombie & Fitch to PMing at Microsoft, and now you're working to help evangelize and build up this ecosystem for Alexa. What are some of the elements of your past experiences that you've been able to bring into this new position? You know, it's interesting. I actually, um, I have a degree in psychology. And so uh, I got out of school and I, I really thought I was heading the full psychologist path. And then I discovered that I, I really liked writing code and it paid really well. Um, and I ended up passing on my grad school offer to uh, to just go to work because I really enjoyed what I was doing. And so in, in having that background, I consistently find myself going back to all of the kinds of studies and research that we would do about people and interactions. Uh, and it's amazing how much it's translated, even even 20 or so years ago when I was in college, uh, which I hate to say that number, but that's, that's still true somehow. Um, so that, I think that's part of it. But I think that the, the big thing that I found is that because I have a degree in psychology and I didn't go for like computer science or something that might be more traditional for someone in my background is that I have, I've had to force feed myself everything. Um, I'm always somebody that's had to learn it on my own, on the fly, on the job and be able to pick things up quickly. And I think that's actually made probably the biggest impact on how I'm able to do the things that I'm doing with Alexa today. I, I don't have the rich background in uh, voice interactions and things that like some of our data scientists do on the Alexa science side. Um, but I understand code. I understand how people want to interact with things. Um, and I can use that pretty readily to be able to translate to building uh, voice experiences. So I guess kind of as like a quick follow up on this, I'm always kind of curious to hear, but are there any roles that you can think of that lend really well into becoming a conversation designer or developer? Um, I think so. I, I, I have seen a lot of success from people that come from the, the graphic design world, um, specifically digital, people that are building interfaces already, because there, there is a science to thinking about how someone's going to use your software. And whether you're building mobile apps or desktop apps or, or websites or whatever, um, that, and that's where a lot of my history has been, it, it seems like designers, it's, it, designing isn't about making something pretty. It's not like, well, they're capable of choosing a better orange than someone else is. Um, designers are thinking deeply about what is it like for the user to get through this experience? What's going to make it not only beautiful, but also incredibly functional? How, how can we get them to get from A to B in a meaningful, fast way, right? Um, and so I, I find that graphic designers do really well, but the, the other one that seems to perform well 
are actually people that have come from uh, like a writing or a journalism background. So whether you're like an author or you write articles, um, being able to like parse and think about what does a conversation really look like? Uh, I think that also makes a huge, huge difference. Awesome. So in the next one, um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about your role and position? There's, there's two and they're kind of on extreme ends. Um, the first one, probably the most common, probably 80% of the time, um, the misconception that I get from people when they say, what, what is an Alexa evangelist? What does that mean? Um, their inkling is to think that I am a paid marketing shill, right? I am, uh, I, I'm the guy that's going to get up with the sham wow and talk about that. And, uh, and what is the other, um, flex seal, right? The, like the televangelist that they get up on TV and they, um, they sell products and they, they're like a pitch man, right? Now, there certainly are aspects of my job for that, but it, it, I like to bring credibility to the table. And so I'm not just someone standing here telling you why this stuff is cool. I have to have done it. I have to be able to demonstrate that I'm capable of doing all of those things too, because there's a, it's very easy to assume that I am um, just a marketing person and not, not technical, not someone that can get into the weeds and build all of this stuff. Uh, and that's actually why I spend a lot of time on Twitch. I, I stream, you know, six to 10 hours a week, probably every week. Uh, most of it is live coding just to not, not to like prove myself, but to stay in practice so that I can be building stuff and participate with people. And a lot of people that are in the chat uh, tune in for that stuff as well, which is, it's, it's great to have people there like asking questions and challenging you on how you think about doing stuff. The other, the other side of it is, um, if, I, if they don't think I'm a marketing person, they assume that I have this rich history in voice interfaces and that I've been building voice stuff since the 80s. And that also isn't true. Um, I'd actually never built anything for voice until about a year before I joined uh, the Alexa team. And it was only because it was really interesting to me. The Echo had just come out. I was really interested in how this stuff worked. I started playing with it, started building some things. Uh, and then I, I, Amazon actually reached out to me and said, hey, we're actually looking for somebody to do some cool stuff. Would you be interested? And that's how I landed here. So um, I, I'm not someone that went to school for a long, long time thinking about AI and machine learning and voice, but uh, I pick it up quickly. And I think like to that point, I can definitely relate. Um, I think that one of the really interesting points about voice is that it is inherently a lot more natural um, than it comes across when you drop terms like conversational AI or right. uh, NLP, NLU, all these scary terms that people that may not have that technical background um, might be wary of. But because it is so natural, because that there are those elements that are very focused on that experience, you have people like yourself or people that uh, have done previous style roles or weren't out of the womb ready for voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> able now to, to really make an impact. So I, I love that story. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Next one, uh, what is the first step in the conversation design and development workflow? Um, th there's a couple paths I could take on this, but I think, I think my common answer to this question is to understand who your users are. Um, it's very, very easy to just, and, and I tend to do this, I will just sit down and start building some stuff. And then you have to take a step back and say, who am I building this for? Who are, who are the people that are actually going to use this thing? And sometimes in the case of that dev thing that I mentioned, it's... Um, other skill builders, which is kind of nice that they're, that I'm one of the audience, but other times like the baseball skill, right? Um, I have to really think about what, what do people really want? And it wasn't just thinking about how I do it, but I know most people when they want to know what's going on with their team, they don't care about wins and losses because that's all relative to what everybody else is doing. But that games back statistic is really important to people that are following their team daily. And so I think identifying your user is the, the core answer to this. But as we think about taking that like to the next step, what does the design development workflow look like? Um, I think the, the key is to identify what are your core happy paths. And this is, this is before you ever even open any code or anything like that. This is sitting down, using the tool of your choice. I, I know VoiceFlow does a good job with this, but there's also uh, Amazon's Skillflow Builder. Um, I know that Adobe has some tools for situational design that you can use. All of these kinds of things do a fantastic job of helping you kind of visualize what your conversations look like, how this stuff's going to flow. Um, 
and understand where your pain points are going to be. How am I going to handle this situation when the user says something I'm not expecting for this case, right? So th those kinds of things, before you've written any code or intents or slots or any of the other stuff that goes with it, is what is what does a, a, a happy path conversation look like? Mm -hmm. And I, I love your point near the end of your presentation as well about really handling on the flip side that error, <laughs> that error state. Because right. there is no happy path unless there's some way of repairing that, of getting that back in. So right. um, I, I totally agree on that workflow as well. Um, the, the next question is really around um, kind of this debate that we've been seeing a lot on people now defining what their role is. Uh, Amazon has done a ton to refer to conversation designers as GUI designers or BUI designers. In your opinion, are there any functional differences in between conversation designer, GUI designer, maybe CXD designer? Um, what does that yeah. look like? I, I think that for me, those terms are, are mostly interchangeable. Um, I think that the, like if you had to divide them up, if there's a thing called conversation designers and there's a thing called VUI designers, voice user interface, I think that there's, there's like 98% overlap um, where conversation designers might be more impactful in thinking about how do I engage? How do, how do I draw someone in? Um, that, that translates more to what I would call a conversation designer, I guess, where a, when I think about traditionally what we refer to as a voice designer, uh, a voice user interface designer, we're often thinking about how the user um, engages with the, the, the interface. So I'm just building a thing that the user can come to. And I think conversation designers oftentimes uh, think about how do, how do I get my thing to more, be more engaging to the user? How do I draw them in? How do I keep coming, them back, coming back? But I think outside of that, for the most part, I would consider those terms to generally be synonyms. They're, they're very, very similar. Um, it's, it, I think it's how you want to identify yourself. Um, but I, in either case, I, I would think, I would have a similar expectation from people identifying with either. Awesome. Do you, you feel like you relate to one of these by any chance or is there anyone outside of evangelists that you connect with? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I, I think that I probably lean more towards the, the VUI designer sort of thing. Um, but again, I, I don't know that there's that dramatic a difference. If I said I was going to design a conversation, I would take the same approach, tack everything. So, um, no, I, I don't. I don't know that I would necessarily identify with one or the other. But I think that uh, at its core, they're they're an invaluable part of what goes on with voice. Awesome. Um, so this is something that's kind of come across a lot. There's a lot of people who are in different stages of understanding voice, of developing on it, or even just trying to innovate in that space, why is it important for teams to start building and iterating now versus potentially later? Okay, so I, I have a really good answer for this. I just had a conversation with someone yesterday about this as well. Um, I graduated college in 1998. Uh, and at that time, the internet was just really starting to explode. Um, every, I mean, there were, there were certainly some of the big names were already there. But in general, there wasn't like most businesses didn't have a website or if they did, it was terrible. And if you knew HTML, you were a God. Like you could walk into any place and be like, hey, I, I know how to build a website. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, we need so much help. I had my nephew build this thing and it's just a bunch of links and it's not manageable and it looks terrible, help us, right? And being there early, being there on the, the forefront of like a lot of the web stuff for me made a huge, huge difference because I did that. I started building and iterating and thinking about what the right way was and the right approach and how do I think about user interface for the web. Uh, I did all that stuff very early so that later I had the experience and the knowledge for when the big dogs came to play and they were like, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch is like, we want to do this. We want to get online. We want to sell all of our products online and we want you to help us do that. I was already somebody that had done that for quite a while where if you, if you think about voice, gosh, we're, we're still so early in what's going on with voice. I mean, I know Amazon always says it's day one, but it's, it's so incredibly early. And there's, there's two things about it being early. One is we're still as technologists, as, as designers, trying to figure out what the right way to do things is. We don't always know the right answer yet. We're, we're trying things, we're experimenting, we're iterating. But the other side of that is that users aren't necessarily always ready for everything we want to try yet either. I remember early on in the web time, I was telling my, wife, my, my mom that 
um, we were building an e-commerce site and people would be able to build, you know, from Burton Snowboards and from Abercrombie and a bunch of other places, they'd be able to just type their credit card in and go. And like that caught her off guard. Like I'm going to type my credit card, com my credit card number into a web page. No way. Right. And now today, like I let the website store my credit card number and they just use it whenever I tell them to, and it's easy and whatever. Um, I think that it's, it's going to take time for users to be comfortable with where ultimately I think at least where I, I know where I hope voice goes. Uh, the, the scenario I like to lay out for people is um, Alexa pipes up just once and says, Hey, I just made you a dentist appointment. I mean, think about what goes in to having Alexa even be able to do that, right? She has to know who my dentist is. She has to know how to interface with my dentist calendar. She has to have access to all of my calendaring data to be able to um, look up and see when I might be available for a dentist appointment. She has to be able to talk to my insurance company and make sure that my insurance company has um, get granted me, you know, coverage to be able to do a dentist appointment, which means it's been at least six months since my last one. All of those pieces and parts have to be able to be available and accessible to my assistant to be able to then tell me, hey, I got you a dentist appointment. Right. So those kinds of things, I think, are going to be really powerful and really impactful on people's lives. But if I went around telling everybody that we're doing that tomorrow, I think there'd be a lot of concern and, and worry because people in general just aren't ready for that. And they may never be ready. We, you know, this is something that takes time and experimentation until we really get there. And so we're getting ready for when people are ready. That's what that's what this time right now is for uh, so that we can do some of those amazing things later. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that when we take for granted in a lot of our digital devices now, how they can speak to each other, how we blindly give permission to so many things and that right. seamless process of just knowing that you can carry a conversation from your phone to your laptop to um, any one of your pre-filled informations beyond that. I think that voice is really gonna be able to enable a lot of those things and even on more of a personal level. So I, I love that yeah. visual. And, and hope one day we will get there and hopefully that's soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this kind of actually builds on some of the elements that you're talking about where it's drawing from context, where it's remembering um, all the elements of the user. Uh, and Amazon's been a, a really big, uh, a really big in situational design and contextual design. Um, have there been any advancements that are of note in that space or how do you recommend teams going about using it in the skills that they're developing? Well, I think as far as advancements go, I don't, I don't know that there, there are major advancements in philosophy. And I really look at situational design as a philosophy. This is an approach that we're going to take. Um, we always start everything from the user. A lot of times when you hear people talk about writing uh, a skill of some kind or any kind of voice experience, um, they often say, okay, Alexa says this, now what does the user say? Okay, now Alexa says this, now what does the user say, right? And that assumption right there that Alexa started the conversation um, is, is where things start to get twisted and it becomes this um, response back and forth where Alexa is driving the conversation. But that's not actually how it works, right? I mean, to start our device, we have to talk. And so the user is always the one that should be driving and the one that should always be in charge. And that's kind of the philosophy behind situational design is, okay, the user is now in this situation. Um, what are we going to say? What are we going to do? But the user is the one kind of driving the situation forward. And, and in that pizza example that I used in my presentation, right, there's nothing that would stop them from starting to order a pizza, adding pepperoni, and then saying, hey, what's the location of your store? What's your store's number? Right? And the skill should be able to respond to those things very, very easily, where if we think about the skill driving the experience, we probably wouldn't have a place for that action. We would say, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. You're ordering a pizza. Um, we want to be able to take them to the place they want to go at the time they want to go there. And maybe they didn't enjoy the skill experience, or maybe the last time they were there, they ordered with pineapple on their pizza, and, but they're not, it's not responding in a way that lets them do pineapple. So now they just want to call the store. Right. It's, it's always, uh, I think for situational design, it's always one of those things that you want to think deeply about what kind of situation the user has created for themselves and what are all the possible things that they might be able to do as a result of it. But you can't rule any of the things out. It's, it's unlikely they're going to ask for a phone number while they're ordering a pizza, but they could. Mm -hmm. um, and building those things out, I think, makes a, a big, big difference. So, uh, no, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen any specific advancements per se, but I think that it is becoming 
something that more people are asking about. More people are asking, how do I go through this process? How do I think about all this stuff? Because again, it's so easy to start building and make it work. But if you don't know who your audience is and you don't know what they're supposed to be doing, um, it's really, really hard to build anything effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that context switching is similar to how we can have a conversation and be like, oh, actually, wait, what about this? And then just dive right back to where we are. Right. It's such an important element. Uh, and I oftentimes, even when I'm talking to uh, to people who are new in voice, refer to that almost as like tab switching when you're in your yep. internet browser. Yep. Uh, it doesn't mean that you've totally stopped and forgotten about that thing, although sometimes that happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have 74 are, tabs open right now. Oh, 100%. <laughs> you are then able to go back to that exact point in the flow and mm -hmm. it remembers all the things that you do. Um, and I think that point is going to be really exciting. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you have a ton of answers for this one um, as, you've, uh, as you've done a ton in the last few years, but what are some frameworks or tools that you use to ideate and prototype your voice experiences? So the place I started was, was, uh, was PowerPoint. Um, it was a really kind of freeform tool that I could use to simply build out some slides and then I could use the slide sort of the organizer to like build out paths that kind of took me through the process. Um, but since then I found that there's, there's a lot of really effective, like there's some great tools out there, including yours. The voice flow stuff is fantastic. Um, but what I tend to lean back on is something that's a little more analog. Um, I'm not interested in building the skill from this design automatically or as part of that process. But what I want is a reference document that I can continue to go back and back and forth with. So I tend to use something like Adobe XD with, um, we have some templates built into that that use uh, responsive design in there. Um, and if not that, then I often find myself um, just using something simple like Notepad or um, any text editor to just keep track of like, these are the things that I'm trying to accomplish. This is the list that I'm working through. Um, that seems to, that, that works really well for me. I don't know that that works well for everyone. Um, but if you want that kind of visual flow looking thing, I think that between voice flow and skill flow builder, I think that there's, there's two really good tools, um, at your disposal there. I could not agree more, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that, um, there's more and more frameworks that are coming out. I know ourselves even, um, I, I myself and I, I resonate with the analog side is I think that you, you still kind of need some of that. Uh, right. Like we use post-it notes even. Um, I feel like that stereotypical picture of someone brainstorming is still in my head involves writing something down. Um, but I think that to your point, it, like skill flow builder, um, voice flows interface, even thinking about charting tools, um, they really help to communicate visually what it is that you're going to build before mm -hmm. you get a little too deep. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, I've been there. I've been there where you're way too deep and you're like, how is anyone even going to do this? Why am I building this thing right now? Um, it's, it's so easy to do. And that's no one's favorite experience. No. All right. I guess on uh, another not so great experience, um, what are some of the biggest pain points that you might see in, let's say, working between designers and developers when building experiences? Um, oftentimes, it's the, the, it's the fact that there's a handoff, I think is the thing that I often run into. Um, with, with voice, I mean, with most software, I think this is true, but I think it's, it's especially true for voice is that it can't, it can't be a handoff. I think in a lot of cases, we try to keep these two organizations separate or apart for whatever reason. Um, I don't know if it's just the stereotype that developers aren't good with people or whatever, but we, we tend to keep the designers and the developers separate in many cases. And so the, the designers go off and do their thing and build their docs and, and get everything ready. And then it's kind of this pitch over the wall, right, to some developers. And then they have to interpret it without a lot of the context that comes with it. And so I think the biggest pain point is making it a handoff. What it should be instead is kind of a collaborative approach where the designers and developers are working together and they can say, okay, I'm building out this design. Uh, ideally designers would be able to build things like um, intents and slots and all of that stuff as well. It's not just a, a conceptual design, but it's actually a physical design that can be implemented by um, building out the, the interaction models and some of that, the ML stuff that goes uh, into having a conversation. But once you've gotten there, there's still gonna be a lot of cases where a developer is gonna have to come back and push and say, I understand that you, like we wanna ask for a user's first name, but what we found in actual implementation is that by opening up that opportunity to say a, a name, 
we now have to create this entire loop where we're making sure we're not constantly changing their name because it, it catches all sorts of weird cases we weren't expecting. Um, how can we rework this or is there a way we could get their name another way? Um, I think all of those things uh, are really, really important. And so if they're not, if they're not sitting at the same desk, table, office, whatever it might be, um, I think that's, that's the biggest pain point to me is um, you're not going to believe this in a, in a bit of software built for communication. Communication is often one of the biggest challenges in, uh, in building them. No, definitely. Uh, especially in like the ideation process when there are sometimes easier ways that we don't even know when we're building it. Yep. Um, and having that collaboration element or whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, I think all of us have been testing the limits on that over the last few months. Um, it's important. Um, yeah. I think in any, in any innovation it is. So it's a really good Agreed. point. Um, so as somebody who provides a ton of resources for people to learn, I'm always kind of curious, where do you go? Uh, wh where is the place that you go to learn? Um, I think this is just a remnant of the fact that I'm constantly scrambling to learn whatever it is. Um, uh, one of the, one of the best things that I've found, and this takes work and, um, it is a challenge is that I have a, I have a very big network on Twitter. Um, it's not, it's, you know, it's not like millions or anything like that. It's, you know, it's a few thousand people, but those few thousand people, uh, make such an impact on my life. The fact that they are subscribed to what I'm saying and, um, responding means that when my, my wife and I have a difference of opinion, which never happens, right? When, when we have a difference of opinion, I can be like, well, why don't we just ask Twitter? Let's, let's see, like, let's see what the pulse is, right? And so we'll go on Twitter and I'll ask a question. And then within minutes, I'll have eight opinions on whatever that thing might be. Should we paint the bathroom navy or cream coat? You know, whatever it is. Um, it, it's, it's quite remarkable. And I use that a lot for development too. Mm -hmm. I'll run into a wall and I'll say, God, there's gotta be a better way to do this. One option, of course, is just to jump into Google and go figure out what people have said. But there's so many different forum sites and I can't tell you the number of times that I find someone asking the exact question I'm asking only to have them say, oh, I solved it with no support or answer actually provided. That's the worst thing you can have. Um, but those kinds of things uh, often lead to a lot of dead ends or very strongly opinionated solutions that may not be right for you. So I tend to lean on Twitter quite a bit, honestly. and um, outside of that, I have a, I have a reasonable network of people that I've just met through my career and I'll, I'll lean into them on whatever the thing might be. I, I've been doing a lot of Node.js development lately as the back end for my Alexa skills. And I kept saying, there's gotta be a better way to organize this. There's gotta, like, I have this one giant file. This can't be the best way. Um, and I called a friend of mine who has been doing Node for three or four years and we sat down for two hours and he blew my mind. Like the, the number of things that I wasn't doing and that I hadn't asked the questions about in addition to the things that I was asking questions about was, was mind blowing. So yes, I definitely use Google to solve and find a lot of answers. Um, but I think that leaning on an existing network of, of Twitter and real people uh, also makes a huge difference. Yeah, no, I, I definitely echo that. Uh, I like recently started to turn to Twitter. Um, my following is not nearly as great as yours uh, and was shocked by what it takes to just get a question out there and just poll. Because oftentimes uh, it's getting over our, our actual internal bias that helps to kind of uh, proceed things a little bit faster. So Very I, much. And, and the, the, thing, the thing with the node stuff is like, it was so, it was, it was a mind blowing two hours of my life where I said, Clark, help me figure this stuff out. And he goes, why are you doing this? And I said, I don't know that like the <laughs> file that I started with had that. And then I copied this one and then I copied that one. It's just always a thing I do. I don't know. And he goes, that is like the worst thing you could do. Let me show you. And he, he like deleted it all and fixed some things. And before I knew it, I was like, well, this is now like two lines of code. This is so much easier. He goes, exactly. And because he's an expert in that stuff and he knows it really well. Why wouldn't I lean on friends of mine that are experts? 100%. Um, I, I have actually like a quick side note around you. You seem to be pretty pro Twitter. Uh, have you seen their newest update that allows you to do voice tweets? I have. I don't, I don't want to get too deep into it because I'm really angry that I haven't been invited to it yet. Um, but they, they do have the, the new concept of um, voice messages, which a little bit like at first I was like, I already don't check my voicemail. Why would I listen to these? But I think the idea behind having voice messages on Twitter is actually really powerful. And I think that if, if Twitter takes it the full way that I think they could, like if you think about like 
uh, Instagram and Snapchat have done really well with filters and um, uh, augmented reality and stuff like that. And there's, there's like you, TikTok does really well with like music and stuff like that. I think that there's an opportunity for Twitter with voice to like, give me the opportunity to filter my voice, to change it a hundred different ways um, or make it enter like to build entertaining voice experiences. It's probably going to end up looking a lot like really short podcasts um, or radio commercials. But I think that um, I think it can be done in a way by people that get it, by that understand voice. I think that would be absolutely awesome. Um, so I, I'm excited about where it could lead. I don't know that I'm excited about it as, as it is today, especially because I can't use it yet. But when I can, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be one of the first ones to start putting some messages out there. Yeah, no, uh, hopefully you'll get invited soon. I know that I've definitely been experiencing some FOMO and some great <laughs> eyebrows as I see it pop up on my screen. Right. So every, time, every time I see someone post a message, I'm like, who's that guy? How did he get it? Uh, it it's always somebody with 50 billion followers that I've just never heard of, but it's, uh, it's still... Yeah, there's a lot of FOMO for sure. <laughs> One day. <laughs> yeah. um, and kind of last question on here before we get to the questions uh, from the community, but what excites you the most about the evolution of conversation design and its potential for its future right now? Well, I kind of mentioned it earlier with the whole dentist scenario. I think that I, I tend not to evaluate too deeply how concerned I'll be about things like privacy. I mean, I, I do think about those things. I don't want to say that I don't, but um, I tend to say, okay, if I'm not concerned about privacy, how far could I take this, right? It's a really interesting thought exercise for me. And what I find more and more is that I, there is so much about my life. Here's a quick story. Um, we've all heard about how Steve Jobs had a wardrobe of just like the same shirt, the same jeans, the same shoes, same socks. Like he didn't ever have to think about ever what he was going to wear that day. And he used it as he, as he used it as an excuse to say, I have bigger problems, bigger things to worry about than what I'm going to wear today. And if I'm using some of those cycles to decide what shirt I'm putting on, then I'm not spending that time solving business problems or whatever it is. Um, I don't know that I subscribe to it as religiously as he did, but I, I like that concept. And think of, gosh, think of all of the things, all the decisions and thought that we have to make every single day that if, if we could just like automate our brains, our personality, whatever, how easy life could be, right? So not even, like think of a dentist appointment right now. I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the horror scenario that I'm going through right now. Um, I made an appointment six months ago. Obviously we had all this COVID stuff happen and my appointment was scheduled for like three weeks ago. So a week before they, um, they reached out and they said, hey, your appointment's in a week. And I was like, oh my God, I made that six months ago. I, I totally booked up. I can't go. So then we start the, the, the dance, right? Where I have to look at my calendar and I'm on the phone with them. And this is taking up both of our times. And I've got to look not only on my work calendar, but on my um, personal calendar, family calendar, all that other stuff. Uh, and I make another appointment. And then I realize, like, oh my gosh, the whole world's shutting down. So now I've got to cancel that and worry about it again. So I've spent, I mean, between my time and the people that work at the dentist office, I probably spent an hour and a half of people's time just trying to reschedule this appointment a few times. It seems silly that I would have to do any of that. So as much decision-making, like meaningless decision-making, I don't really care when my dentist appointment is. I probably care more about what I'm having for dinner. But even that, it could probably predict like, well, he had pizza last night. We definitely shouldn't recommend that. Let's pick something else. Um, I think that those kinds of things, the, the automated decision-making, take that and just push it away. I don't, I don't wanna have to make those decisions anymore much like Steve was doing. I think that's a feature that I'm really excited about. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that um, with the element of voice really becoming your assistant, like really, really taking on that, right. that personality and being able to mishandle or not mishandle, to handle um, all of those miscommunications, right. all of I, those things I think will be great. I often think about this, and this was shared with me yesterday morning, a colleague of mine named Aaron Wilson, but he said, I, I, vision, I envision a place where Alexa is the best everything for me. And so imagine someone that is very wealthy that has a large staff at their mansion. I imagine like Daddy Warbucks, right, from the movie Annie. Um, he's, got, um, he's got butlers, he's got a driver, he's got a chef, he's got all of these people that are there just to provide mm -hmm. him with some service. Maybe it's making a great meal, maybe it's getting me someplace, whatever it is. And Alexa could be the best of all of those things, the best personal trainer, the best chef, the best everything, right? Maybe she's not gonna drive your car for you, but she could at least navigate the directions for you. 
Um, and I think that that's, that's a future that I'm really excited about. If I could have access to all of those things without having to be a billionaire, that'd be pretty good. I totally agree. I, <laughs> I would love that as well. Um, and just to kind of uh, qu clear things off uh, as we're running close to our time, we got time for two questions. So the first one is, how do you handle the unexpected um, when you're testing, I'm assuming, or let's say sending out your first round of your experience? Sure. So one of the ways that I do that when I expect the unexpected um, is that you know the you know the scope of what you can expect, right? Uh, so oftentimes we'll build a slot. Maybe it's a list of baseball teams or a, a, a ingredients in a recipe or something like that. Those are the things you can expect. Uh, what you need to do is let your users know, like, hey, you said this thing. I have no idea what to do with that information, and say that in a meaningful way back to them. Hey, I heard you say taco cake. I, I don't know what a taco cake is. Um, but is there something else I can help you with, right? Like at least be very clear that like, here's the thing I heard you say, maybe they were wrong, right? Maybe they said Taco Bell and you heard taco cake somehow. Um, those kinds of things can certainly happen. We're talking about something where we're, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of layers between what the user said and what you actually receive in your code mm -hmm. um, and figuring out how to navigate those things I think is really important. So the, the key for me anyway, is in handling the unexpected is to pair it back to the user, what you heard so that you're giving them any kind of clue or context about why it might not have worked. Hmm. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. I think using your custom variables and slots to be able to do that also helps with data, uh, trying to figure yeah. out how many times you register something that is totally incorrect. I know we, we hit that all the time uh, with how finicky phonetics can be. So, yeah. so a good point on that. <laughs> and uh, the last question before we kind of clear things off is what is kind of the high level design process in a conversation. We kind of talked about the first step, but could you outline kind of what a bigger picture would look like? Yeah, so like when I think about a conversation at every step, there's new context, there's new information, there's new data. And so in every step of your conversation, there's more to know, there's more to gather. Um, I'll give a good example uh, in the this dev tip skill that I'm building. There's about a hundred or so things that I'm prepared to answer questions about, right? tell me about persistence or tell me about how I sell things or whatever. Um, but as I mentioned in my presentation, I don't think anyone has any idea what the hundred things are. They're just gonna ask the skill stuff that is interesting or useful to them. I may not know the synonyms. I may not have exact matches for what they asked me. So I give them the luxury of being able to do things like, um, give me something new. Well, give me something new has a lot of weight behind it. That means that I've been keeping track of all the things I've ever told you before. And then I'm going to pick from a list of things that aren't on the list I've already given you. So as I build a conversation out and I think about what that structure looks like, it's more than just open the skill. Once I've opened the skill, I already have some context, right? This is the first interaction we've had this time. It might be the first interaction we've had ever. Those certainly change things. Um, but then once I get to that second step and that third step, I've learned more about them. I've learned what they want, what, what their priorities are. Maybe they're a really new user and they don't know what to do. They open the skill and they said, help, boom. Okay, now I know some things about you. And I can use that to evaluate how I should shape my conversation back to you. Um, and as, as if you guys ever get an opportunity to watch me um, build skills, this is something that I focus deeply on is all of these little cases. How do I think about what happens if they say this thing, but they don't already know this thing? How do I handle that, that kind of scenario? Um, so it's, the conversation flow should be build out your happy paths. Think about the context that you can build to facilitate that happy path. And how does that context translate if you jump to one of the other paths? If, I, if I'm heading down the pizza building path and then they say, what's the store information? Is it possible that we could somehow send the information we've already gathered to the store so that when they call, we could, the person on the phone could be like, oh, it looks like you were in the middle of ordering a pizza. Like that would be huge, right? That would blow my mind if that actually happened. Um, but it's, it's about managing and maintaining context about your user's experience now and in the past um, that I think is, is the key to thinking about all of your other flows. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff, for spending your afternoon with us. Certainly. Um, do you have any kind of one-liner parting wisdom for the audience? Uh, parting wisdom. I think the, the biggest thing I can say is, like, you have to do it. It's so easy to sit around and think about what would I do or how would this work? you have to actually do it to really gain the experience that you're going to need to have the expertise here. Go, go do, go build. 
it's worth it. <laughs> and thanks so much, guys, for everybody joining in the audience. As you guys know, this is part of a series where we're really trying to highlight the leaders in this space. Uh, we have a ton coming up, uh, closing off this month and next. So join us if you want to hear more about the conversation design workflow with our head of product, Rob Hayes. Um, and then we're also featuring Tony Natochi, uh, who's the lead conversation designer at Uber. Um, and we also always have some lovely fix it hours with our in-house resident, Nico, AKA our in-house Jeff, um, to talk about uh, how you can build some really cool things for Alexa. Um, so if you guys are not already part of it, feel free to join our community. We'd love to hear any feedback that you guys have or anything you'd like us to do next. And thank you so much again, Jeff, for joining us. It was Certainly. great to have you here today and have all the things that you shared. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys.